petrochemical industry. Um, let's see, I'm so, so sorry. Yeah, um, and fuels, um, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, fuel. Um, and if, you know, if you think about that, that raises a whole lot of challenge, challenge for us because as a society, we benefit greatly from these industries. And you can imagine, imagine I talk to a room full of chemists about potentially getting rid of the, the petrochemical industry. That's sort of bread and butter. Um, so so it, it may be a little bit unpopular um, among, among chemists. It's okay. I don't, don't mind. Um, it, it, it's for a, um, a better goal. And, and um, we really do need to think about, about other ways to, to obtain the benefits of the types of industries is without, without carbon, and that's the real key. And I think this has to do with how you think about the elements in the periodic table, at least it's the way I think about it. About it. If you're a petroleum chemist, your periodic table might look, look something like this, where, where all air point at carbon, carbon the most important, important element, and the other elements are there for color, to, um, to bond carbon and, and give some variety. And then there's some other elements that uh, are not really interesting at all. <laughs> as, as an inorganic chemist, periodic table looks like this, and I embrace all, all of the elements. All of the elements are just as important to me as each other. And um, I think you have to take this, this kind of holistic view. If, if we want to try to um, get, the, get the same benefits that we've gotten from carbon-based based history, we're going to need to employ all of the other elements in the periodic table to get um, to get those benefits as well. And so tonight, I'm mainly going to fo focus on nitrogen. And um, you'll see why, because I think there's a lot of um, promise for switching fr from carbon to nitrogen as a base for um, for our society, at least at least in terms of energy, um, and, and it's right now to carbon, so it's not too far away from things that we, we know and understand. From very simple simple proposals uh, in school, I'm sure you're taught that that this important isotope of nitrogen has a mass of 14. It's got not in the time of seven, five valence electrons. If you if you remember how to draw dot diagrams, you'll do something like this, where you have two electrons that are paired, and you have three electrons that really want to, to be paired. And so nitrogen very, very really forms a dimer where these three electrons pair up with, with electrons of a neighboring molecule to form a very short and strong, strong bond and makes this nitrogen molecule rather unreactive. So much, so much so that it makes up about a percent of the Earth's atmosphere. We breathe it in and out, and it does not um, affect us adversely at all. And uh, it, so it doesn't react chemically. It doesn't, doesn't really like to interact with itself. You have to go to very, very low temperatures in order to get nitrogen to liquefy. And then you use nitrogen, liquid hydrogen as a cry, cry for a number of applications because of that. So Tom didn't tell you what there is today. I've got a really, really big number here. <laughs> This number, is, is it the number of nitrogen atoms in the universe, the number of nitrogen atoms in the solar system, the solar system, the number of nitrogen atoms in the Earth's atmosphere, or the, the number of nitrogen atom atom in the human body? We'll do a little vote. Anyone want for, for A? B? C? Couple take or C? D? Okay, I think the majority has, has it. D, this is on average number of nitrogen atoms in the body. This is a, a really good, good way to get a sense of scale. It's a huge number. So nitrogen is really, really, really in biological systems. And if you look very closely at how biology works, you'll understand why. Um, so protein, protein um, crystallographers give us these beautiful ribbon diagrams. It's the structures of protein. But if you zoom in, to these uh, ribbons, they're made, made of chains that contain carbon, 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 nitrogen, carbon, 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 nitrogen, repeat units that just keep going.
nitrogen atoms just by themselves. And that uh, every protein is going to have this. Of course, another, another really important biological molecule that um, probably most of you know, know about, DNA, the famous double helix, um, it, it has structure because of nitrogen. The nitrogen in atoms, the blue atoms in this uh, diagram, that connect the two sides side the helix together and make it into a double helix. And, and um, different arrangements of the nitrogen atoms in these uh, bases is, um, are basically encoding for life. So let's take a step back. I, I told you that the elemental nitrogen is really unreactive, but, but it's also really, really important in biology. So it brings up a really important question. How does nitrogen get into biological systems if it's mainly found as elemental nitrogen? It's completely unreactive. So the miracle that happens, happens here is something called nitrogen fixation. And we have a number of ways in which it happens. Um, there's natural process. Um, the one that uh, I really like when it rains, out, rains outside, lightning. Um, I really love lightning storm because that is the that best way to see elemental nitrogen. The, the blue color that, uh, that you get when you see a lightning strike is color being emitted nitrogen atoms in their excited state as they, they relax into the ground sound state. But um, the energy of the lightning strike not, not only puts those nitro nitrogens to an excited state, but it also allows this nitrogen to react with, with oxygen. And you can have this reaction down here where nit nitrogen oxygen react to make nitrogen ox oxide, we call NOx, um, and these will react with water to make this molecule nitric acid, um, and nitric acid will come down as acid rain, um, but it's actually one of the best ways to get incorporated into biological systems because it's soluble, uh, and it can be easily taken up by uh, plant life, for example. So that's one way that, that we get uh, natural nitrogen fixation. And about 9% of the uh, nitrogen in the biosphere comes from this process. Um, more complicated way is what nature figured out how to do. Nature figured out how to take nitrogen and react it with electrons and hydrogen ions in a protein to make ammonia. And the proteins that do this are called nitrogenases. And it's a very, very energy intensive reaction. It requires 16 molecules of ATP um, to be uh, hydrolyzed in order to get this to happen. Uh, and you can see it's quite complicated because the proteins are, you know, they're gigantic. Um, and if you zoom in to where the nitrogen binds in this protein and gets transformed into ammonia, um, you get to uh, this funny looking um, compilation of a whole bunch of unusual atoms. So there's the cyan atom is molybdenum, the yellow is sulfur, the red is oxygen, the orange is iron, and the, there's a carbon atom in the middle. We really have no idea why this um, structure forms and even less of an idea of how it allows nitrogen to be transformed into ammonia. Um, by an electrochemical process. Um, but uh, there's a lot of people studying how this works uh, to try to understand it better because it does happen um, on quite a massive scale and under very mild conditions. Okay. Um, humans have also figured out how to fix nitrogen. And there is an industrial process that we use called the Haber-Bosch process named off after the, um, the two discoverers, the academic discovery that was kind of more fundamental uh, by Fritz Haber, and then the discovery um, by Carl Bosch, an engineer at BASF, a chemical company in Germany, um, that allowed this process to be done on a larger scale and commercialized. Um, this remarkable reaction, I would say is I, I rank it up there with the discovery of fire as like the most important achievements of humankind. 
um, and amazingly, this happened in a very short period between 1905 and 1910. Um, the discovery and um, industrialization of this process. The reaction is, is very simple. Nitrogen plus hydrogen makes ammonia. And there's some very interesting aspects of this reaction that are worth talking about. It's what's called an equilibrium reaction, which means it's a reaction that doesn't go to completion. Um, once the reaction is completed, or once it's, it's done doing what it's gonna do, you still have a mixture of the starting materials and products in this reaction. And what is useful about this is that you can control equilibria with, by changing the temperature and pressure. So you can use temperature and pressure to push the equilibrium to one side or the other, uh, depending. You need to get in? <laughs> technical issue. Um, so that's a very useful aspect of this reaction. Um, the other thing that is noted here is that this is a catalyzed reaction. Um, the catalyst, which is um, one of several metals that are listed here, one you might very easily recognize and some that you may have never heard of before. Um, so a catalyzed reaction, the catalyst um, allows the molecules to interact in ways that um, will facilitate the reaction to occur. If there's no catalyst, the nitrogen and hydrogen and the reactor will just sit there and stare at each other. Nothing will happen. But as soon as you've got the catalyst there under the right conditions, the equilibrium is established and you get production of ammonia. Um, so this is a very important reaction. This is how the Pavar-Bosch process is done nowadays. Um, the company Halder Topso in uh, Denmark is one of the biggest ammonia producers in the world. And this is a picture of one of their Haber Bosch plants. To give you a sense of scale, uh, what you have running through here is a, um, a railway line. Uh, and that's important because of how this uh, process works. Um, so I, I want to just very briefly uh, guide you through what's going on here. The inputs to this are methane and water that get converted into hydrogen and air, which gives us the nitrogen and the oxygen that uh, converts the carbon into CO2, which we eliminate. Um, and then we uh, are left with a mix of these gases, nitrogen, hydrogen, CO2, CO2 is scrubbed. Um, and then the nitrogen and hydrogen get put into this one, which is the Haber-Bosch reactor. And you'll see um, the uh, high temperature and high pressure that are necessary to get this Haber-Bosch reaction to go. We use 450 degrees C, 300 atmospheres more or less, um, and a metal catalyst to get this reaction to go. The ammonia that's produced is siphoned off and it's condensed into liquid form in this cooler. And then it's put directly into a railway tanker car. And the best plants um, uh, that use this process, they fill somewhere between 40 to 50 railway tanker cars per day. We make an awful lot of ammonia. And um, we make so much of it, it's really quite cheap. The main use of it, of course, as Tom mentioned, is in agriculture where we turn it into fertilizer, um, ammonium nitrate. Um, and uh, yeah, I should mention, uh, there are some Nobel prizes for uh, uh, the Haber-Bosch Haber -Bosch process, Haber and Bosch themselves, as well as, as, well as the more recent uh, Nobel laureate, Gerhard Ertel, who worked out an atomic scale mechanism for how the reaction works. That I'm not gonna go into detail with. Um, but I do want to talk about how we get from ammonia to ammonium nitrate, um, because it's not as simple as you might think. Um, if you just take ammonia and try to oxidize it with oxygen, do a combustion reaction, um, ammonia doesn't burn that well, but it does burn, and it makes nitrogen when you do that. So this is the uh, main product of combustion of ammonia, and we're going to come back to that later. 
Uh, there's a really important reaction, another catalyzed reaction that was discovered by Ostwald, another Nobel Prize winner, who showed that you can, under the right conditions, overoxidize ammonia and make nitric oxide instead of making elemental nitrogen. And this is the key to getting us to nitrate, the nitrate part of ammonium nitrate, because you can take nitric oxide, react it with more oxygen to make NO2, react that with water to make HNO3, nitric acid, react this with ammonia, and you've got ammonium nitrate. And this process, the discovery of the Haber-Bosch process has had an absolutely staggering impact on society. It's been called the detonator of the population explosion. And I wanna read this first sentence because I like it. Without ammonia, there would be no inorganic fertilizers and nearly half the world would go hungry. So another way of looking at that, basically if on average, 50% of the nitrogen atoms and the human body have gone through the Haber-Bosch process. Or without the Haber-Bosch process, you can cut the world's population in half. So that's why I rank this up there with the discovery of fire. I also have the um, yin and yang symbol, symbol here because there are good things about ammonium nitrate and there's bad things about ammonium nitrate. And um, it is worth um, mentioning some of the bad things that can happen. This is one of the more recent um, explosions that uh, have occurred due to um, what seems very poor storage of ammonium nitrate. It's an absolutely enormous explosion in Beirut um, that leveled a large part of, of their port. Um, so I think it's important to understand that we um, recognize the importance of handling these kinds of chemicals properly when we use them. Okay, second question on the quiz. Wisconsin is a major agricultural state. We know that, right? So we must use a lot of ammonium nitrate fertilizer. How many Haber-Bosch plants do we have in the state of Wisconsin? A, zero to five, okay, quite a few. B, somewhere between five and 10, couple for that. 10 to 20, more than 20? Would you believe zero? There are no Haber-Bosch plants in Wisconsin, why? The Haber-Bosch um, ammonia synthesis is a highly centralized process, not just in the United States, but all over the world. One of the things that I kind of glossed over when I talked about the uh, Haber-Bosch process was that one of the inputs was methane. Um, methane being the main component of natural gas. Um, we build these gigantic Haber-Bosch plants where we have the natural gas, which is why there's a gigantic one down here in the Louisiana Gulf Coast. And there's why there's a bunch of them now in Alberta, the tar sands area, okay? So um, this is uh, the way that, that this is currently done. We do the ammonia synthesis in these very localized places, and then we ship the ammonia out to where we need it. This is either by railway car or by pipelines. And these are the liquid ammonia pipelines that go from Louisiana up to the agricultural areas in, in the country. Um, so, you know, you would think that there might be better ways to do this. And the rest of my talk is really going to be more forward looking to what are some of the better ways we could do this. And I want to focus on this first question. If the major input for Haber-Bosch is the fossil fuel, methane, if you can find a way to do Haber-Bosch that doesn't rely on methane, you can potentially decentralize ammonia synthesis. Is there a way to decentralize and decarbonize ammonia synthesis? That's an interesting um, question. So let's, let's pursue this a little bit. Um, so if you read 
the uh, recent literature about ammonia synthesis from, from the chemical industry, it gets very colorful very fast. They talk about different colors of ammonia depending on where the hydrogen comes from for their Haber-Bosch reaction. Um, so we've got you know brown and gray and turquoise, all sorts of different colors of ammonia. Um, the original Haber-Bosch uh, reaction was done through uh, hydrogen that was created from coal gasification. This was done in the Ruhr Valley um, where I was a postdoc. So uh, I've seen some of the, uh, the impacts of that when I was over there. Uh, this is what people refer to these days as brown ammonia. Um, the uh, ammonia that has natural gas as the hydrogen source is called gray ammonia. And there are these uh, attempts to try to sequester the carbon that comes out of these processes that have been labeled with these other colors. Mm -hmm. You can also get hydrogen from gasification of biomass. There wasn't a color for this one, so I called it yellow ammonia because, you know, corn. Um, and then the, um, this, so this goes from um, most carbon intensive to least carbon intensive, where the most ideal would be to do water electrolysis, to electrolyze water into hydrogen and oxygen, and then use that hydrogen to react with ammonia to make, or to react with nitrogen to make ammonia. And this is what people are calling green ammonia. So um, this would, in principle, not really require any carbon inputs, except for the fact that you're still relying on the Haber-Bosch reaction itself, which does require the high temperatures, the high pressures, and you do need to get uh, to those conditions. So that has prompted people to start thinking about ways of synthesizing ammonia that go beyond Haber-Bosch. Can we do this under different conditions? I'm gonna highlight just a few things that, that are areas that people are working on. One is an electrochemical uh, process where the idea, so electrochemistry is uh, the use of electricity uh, in a chemical, uh, to drive a chemical reaction, you could think of it that way. And in this case, we're gonna use an electric, electrical input to have nitrogen converted to ammonia at an electrode surface and water oxidized to oxygen at the other electrode, you have to have two electrodes to balance, one doing the oxidation, the other one doing the reduction, because everything has to balance out. Um, but you could use the energy input from um, renewable sources. You know, over the, the time that I've been a faculty member at UW-Madison, it's been amazing to see uh, that you know, solar electricity has just gotten more and more cheap and easier to, to acquire. So you can imagine running this with solar electricity, so input of light, air gives you the nitrogen, and water, light, air, and water gives you ammonia. Uh, so this is kind of a magic reaction in a way. This would be what I would call truly green ammonia, um, more green than the previous uh, what was on the previous slide, because there's no need for any carbon in this, this process. Another one that's more relevant to Wisconsin maybe, um, is that you can actually recover significant amounts of ammonia from waste, manure. Um, and this is, my students have, have called this black and white ammonia, <laughs> uh, or black and white spotted ammonia. Um, this is kind of fun. Um, this one wouldn't be quite as zero carbon because uh, cows also do produce an awful lot of methane. Um, so that's, but it is potentially a very interesting source of ammonia um, that uh, the nitrogen atoms don't necessarily have to go through the Haber Bosch process to get there. And I also want to highlight a really interesting report from a group at Harvard that um, is kind of a hybrid approach using um, electrochemistry and biology together. So they are using a set of electrodes to split water into oxygen and hydrogen. And then they're using that hydrogen to feed specially engineered bacteria. And these bacteria 
have not only the nitrogenase enzymes that I talked about before, but they also have hydrogenase enzymes. Hydrogenase enzymes, they can metabolize the hydrogen and then feed that hydrogen to the nitrogenase enzymes where they can use that hydrogen to react with nitrogen and make ammonia. And um, the way that they've demonstrated uh, this is that um, the more of these bacteria they have in the soil, um, the bigger the radishes they can grow. So that's kind of a cute result. Um, so this is going directly from light, water, and nitrogen to growing crops. So, um, and, and I do think that uh, the use of ammonia in agriculture is going to continue to be the most important. I think it is a necessity for us to solve um, the problem of malnourishment. But I do want to think about the possibility of ammonia as a potential zero carbon fuel. Because I told you before, you can burn ammonia, and when you do that, you get nitrogen. Nitrogen is already 80% of the atmosphere, and it's not a greenhouse gas. Uh, so it's potentially a way that we can um, really decarbonize things. So there have been, um, there, there are, I guess, three main players in terms of thinking about fuel economies of the future. Um, you've probably heard of the idea of a hydrogen economy. Um, so basically uh, using hydrogen to fuel things. Um, there's also ideas to use methanol. And of course, I'm telling you about ammonia. And uh, so I wanted to show you this kind of analysis that compares the three. Um, the idea with the hydrogen economy is that, you know, you would have a solar farm that you use that electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. You can use that hydrogen directly as a fuel. Um, but you can also use it to combine with nitrogen to make ammonia or to combine with CO2 to make methanol. And ammonia and methanol could potentially also be used as fuels. Methanol would probably be the most similar to the gasoline that we're more that we're used to because just because it's a liquid. Uh, but ammonia actually liquefies pretty readily. And um, I'll show you that it can also be used. Um, in similar ways. Um, so you can do a cost comparison of ammonia, hydrogen, and methanol. And ammonia really comes out a winner here for a couple of reasons. What kills hydrogen is that we just don't have the infrastructure to distribute hydrogen. Um, that is uh, going to incur a major cost to hydrogen. And, you know, very often when I give a talk like this, I'll include a picture of the Hindenburg just to um, <laughs> remind people that there are also safety issues with hydrogen, <laughs> um, but I didn't do that today. Um, comparing ammonia to methanol, the big difference here is this red part, which has to do with uh, getting the starting materials from the air. Um, nitrogen, of course, 80% of the air already, it doesn't take a lot of energy to collect nitrogen. CO2 is less than 1% of the, the atmosphere. We have to input a lot of energy to collect that CO2 and uh, concentrate it to use it. But of course, um, the 500 pound gorilla in the room is that this is still four and a half times the, the cost of gasoline. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't areas where um, the cost analysis works out in the favor of ammonia. And, you know, for a historical example of this, in World War II, the Allies had a blockade against Germany. They couldn't get oil from the Middle East. It's one of the reasons they, they invaded Russia, bad idea. Um, but they had invented the Harbor Wash process, and they needed their buses to run on time. So they tried running their fleet of buses in Belgium off of ammonia, and it worked. So this is a picture from, from those times. There are more recent um, uh, examples where people have used ammonia in, uh, in vehicles. So there is an active research area in looking at internal combustion engines, trying to get them to work with ammonia. And um, the thing that's actually closest to, to reality here is in the maritime shipping industry, 
this is where we harken back to my very first slide. Um, there's a company on Australia that is putting a container ship on the water in 2022 that runs off of ammonia. 2022 is this year. So this is happening. Uh, and there are many other companies that are following suit. Uh, so this is a big change uh, that's happening in the shipping area. Um, the downside of using internal combustion engines for ammonia oxidation is that they're going to also produce a small amount of NOx, which um, it's not so good for the environment. And what you'd really like to have is a cleaner reaction that uh, just gives you nitrogen as a product when you oxidize it. And this is where we're going to use electrochemistry again, but in a backwards way from the way I presented it before. So last time I told you we were using electrochemistry, we were using electricity to drive a chemical reaction. We're gonna do it the other way. We're going to have a chemical reaction produce electricity. And that's what a fuel cell is. Um, and the fuel for this fuel cell uh, is ammonia. And there are a couple of um, different designs of ammonia fuel cells. This is what's called a solid oxide fuel cell. It operates at very high temperatures, high enough temperatures that um, the first step in the process is that ammonia decomposes into nitrogen and hydrogen. And then the hydrogen is fed into the fuel cell and it's basically a hydrogen oxygen fuel cell. No different from if you just used hydrogen as the fuel itself, which, you know, you ask me, it kind of defeats the purpose of using ammonia in the first place, except that ammonia is a lot easier to transport than hydrogen is. So there's places where this could uh, potentially be useful. Um, you can also do um, what's called a direct ammonia fuel cell, and these operate at lower potentials. And what, why this is called a direct ammonia fuel cell is because you have an, a reaction of ammonia at the electrode surface uh, the ammonia is oxidized to nitrogen. And that's what happens at one of the electrodes. The other electrode is going to be reduction of oxygen. Um, these still do operate under what you might call um, uh, aggressive conditions. So molten sodium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide solutions. They've got it down to like 80 degrees C is the lowest operating temperature right now. You have to use pretty expensive electrodes to get these to work. Um, so there's a lot of room for improvement for these, but this is another way that you could use ammonia and go directly to electricity. So um, what my group has been looking at is just from a very bird's eye view of, of this area, uh, is the idea of a completely zero carbon nitrogen economy that uh, operates off of interconversions of nitrogen and ammonia. So there's basically two, two problems that you need to solve to realize this. The first problem is you need efficient ways of turning renewable electricity into a driving force to make nitrogen into ammonia. So electrochemical nitrogen or ammonia synthesis from nitrogen. And then you also need the flip reaction to be able to produce electricity by oxidizing ammonia to nitrogen uh, in a fuel cell. And um, so I think there's promise for both of these. And the problem that my lab has really focused on recently is this problem here. How do you oxidize nitrogen, or sorry, ammonia to nitrogen um, in a way that's consistent with use in a fuel cell? And what we do in my lab is we discover catalysts that are based on other elements of the periodic table that are a bit more exotic but um, we use them in ways that allow us to do this fundamental chemistry with nitrogen. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of uh, one of the things that we've discovered. The perfect catalyst for nitrogen, uh, for ammonia oxidation to nitrogen would operate here with a reduction potential of 0 0.9 volts. And um, the best catalyst that people have come up with before are these red ones um, that are shown here, these compounds with this metal center. The metal is, is uh, ruthenium, probably one of the ones that you might not have heard of before, um, but I'll introduce it to you. 
It's right below iron in the periodic table. Um, so ruthenium is our metal of choice as well. These ruthenium catalysts, they operate at potentials that are way up here and are not consistent with use in a fuel cell because they operate either too close or too high uh, compared to this oxygen reduction potential. You need to have oxygen redu reduction happening at the other electrode in order to get uh, electricity. Uh, so if you can get a catalyst that operates at a potential significantly lower than this, it allows you to do that. And that's what we discovered in my lab. That's this um, blue line here, this complex that has two ruthenium stuck together, which is kind of um, what we're known for. Um, to, to make these kinds of compounds, that gives us enough energy uh, to produce a voltage that you could potentially use as a fuel cell to get energy. Um, and to really prove the point, we did a few really key experiments that I'll show you. Um, the catalyst, when it reacts with ammonia, it produces nitrogen and it changes color. And the way that we watch this is through ch watching changes in the absorption spectrum. The catalyst has these two peaks here, and when it reacts with ammonia, those two peaks go away. Very simple. So that's ammonia oxidation, it makes nitrogen, and then we can react that reduced species with oxygen and those peaks come back up again. And then we add ammonia again and those peaks go down again. This molecule is acting like a teeny tiny version of an internal combustion engine that's running off of ammonia. And that's something that's never really been seen before. Um, and it's why we were really excited about it and uh, why we um, have uh, had a lot of interest in this, this particular work. It's been very exciting. Um, but we're not really done yet. We have a lot more work to do. And um, the next steps for us are to actually build these into fuel cells make a device that actually generates electricity from ammonia. Uh, that's an important next step that we're working on. And we're also working on the design of new catalysts that operate even closer to this idealized potential for nitrogen reduction. So we can maximize the amount of energy or the voltage that you get for a fuel cell that would run with this kind of catalyst. So um, that is, um, more or less my story. I want to take a step back and go back to this slide that I showed earlier. There's a lot of problems in the world that um, we need to solve and we need to find new ways of doing things um, that don't involve carbon. I'm not saying that ammonia is going to solve all of these problems, but I can tell you that ammonia is going to be part of the solution to a number of these. And so um, I I think I'd just like to leave you with that and also with the idea that there's a lot more chemistry that needs to be discovered to help um, work out these kinds of problems to really decarbonize um, not just our energy economy, but the rest of our economy as well. Uh, there's a lot more elements on the periodic table. Though. So there's a lot of uh, room for new chemists with new ideas. Speaking of the chemists with wonderful ideas, this is my research group. Um, they're all really fantastic and smart people. Um, the one who's been working uh, very most closely on this ammonia project is Mike Trinary, is uh, right there. Um, but everyone else is uh, working on all sorts of other projects as well. Um, it's a really wonderful group of people. This was back in summer when we thought COVID might be going away. So <laughs> you can see everyone's happy. <laughs> but here we are wearing masks again. Uh, so thank you all for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I was wondering, what would be the cost range for one of these uh, platinum iridium electrodes I imagine it would be very high. And related to that, uh, with the use of ruthenium, would there be a cost factor? Because I believe that's also considered a platinum group metal. Yeah, very good. Very good question. 
Um, do you need me to repeat the question or is that would be helpful? Okay. So um, question from this gentleman is about the cost comparison of platinum and iridium electrodes versus the ruthenium, which is also a platinum group metal that we're using in our process. Um, so these are all um, elements that are not as abundant in the Earth's crust. And so they're more rare. Um, the advantage that I would say we have in our system is that we're using a catalytic amount of this very expensive element. So we're not using a gigantic electrode that's built out of platinum. We're using a few atoms of ruthenium to do the reaction. And that small amount of ruthenium can do the reaction again and again and again. Whereas, um, you know, if you're scaling up a process where you need to make a bigger electrode because you need to do the reaction on a bigger scale, that's a huge investment in platinum and iridium. Uh, so that's why I focused on catalysis for this for this project. Good question. How difficult is it to make that bosonic catalyst and how many cycles can it be? Good question. But two quick good questions. How difficult is it to make our exotic catalyst and um, how many cycles can it do? Um, it's not super difficult. I have an undergrad who can make it. Uh, well, he's actually a really talented undergrad. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of um, it takes, I think we can make, you know, gram scale quantities of it in a week. Um, and that can be scaled up quite readily. Uh, about a week's worth of work. Um, there are some kind of overnight reflux uh, conditions to make it, but um, it's not. Some of us know a lot about overnight reflux. Yes, <laughs> yes. Then the other question, how many, cycles can it do? We've counted up to five, um, but we stopped counting because we got tired of counting, um, not because the catalyst stopped or anything. It's because you know, we were watching it all day and we wanted to go home. Um, so we have not yet pushed this catalyst to its limit to see just how many cycles it can do before it completely falls apart. Uh, that's another important experiment that we still need to do. Thank you. Where does ruthenium come from? Where does it come from? Yeah, so it, ruthenium is found with the other platinum metals. Um, and you know, we get the platinum metals basically as a byproduct of um, the formation or the, you know, when we're mining for copper and nickel and making copper and nickel metal, um, we, that's an electrochemical process that produces this stuff called anodic slime, which is a mix of all the platinum metals. And then that slime is then treated and you separate out all the metals. Uh, so anywhere where you copper slime. Oh, copper is all over the place. And, and so ruthenium is not, it's not a really rare element. I, well, I mean, it's more rare than copper. <laughs> 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 but in terms of, you know, the geopolitics of it, um, it's not like localized in one, you know, country that, you know, we would need to, uh, is it? Is the University of Wisconsin really at the forefront or pioneering in this development ahead of any other places? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is about whether the <clears throat> University University of Wisconsin could be considered at the forefront of this. Um, I would say that our catalyst is the best one out there. Um, it was not the first catalyst discovered, but it's the best catalyst discovered to date. 
Um, so if you ask me, yeah, I'm at the forefront. <laughs> <laughs> Sign up for the humility lessons here. I know. <laughs> I thought I was good at humility. Um, can you say, uh, from online, can you say if the ruthenium compound is air stable and how easy to synthesize since I can't address the ease of synthesis? Yeah, those, those are good questions. So we talked about the synthesis a little bit. Um, the catalyst precursor is air stable. Um, uh, we make it on the bench, it's, it's bench stable. And that's one of the real um, interesting discoveries for us is that when it reacts with ammonia, it oxidizes ammonia to nitrogen. And then the product that we get from the catalyst, that is air sensitive and reacts with oxygen and it regenerates the oxidized form that's air stable. Um, so that's, that's one of the keys to why this chemistry works. Another question from online. Is there a particular reason that this is being utilized in maritime shipping first? What makes that a good fit? Not having to carry a lot of fuel? That's it. That's it. Yeah, it's the weight of the fuel. Um, ammonia, yeah, it's a molecule with only four atoms in it, and three of them are hydrogen. Uh, it's a really, really light fuel or you know, very high energy density, I would say. And the other reason that this is being used in the maritime shipping industry is that there are more stringent um, uh, regulations for emissions of, uh, of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So that's why they have decided that ammonia is the way to go. Sarah's online is asking, what poisons the catalyst? We haven't tried to poison the catalyst. So we don't know. <laughs> if you hire me, I'm very good at poison. <laughs> um, are you aware of the work of Enable Fuel Cell Corporation? I am not, but I would like to learn. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sandy's posted a report from 20 years ago in 2002. Generation of hydrogen bioliquid phase reforming with carbohydrate derived oxygenated compounds. So I'll send that to you. Yeah, please do. Thank you. He's got a couple of others here. Next, is the bond between the ruthenium atoms a double bond or a triple bond? I thought I saw a dash line. Very intriguing compound, which makes me wonder about the intermediate and associated kinetics. Yes, um, very good question. A very astute observation. I've drawn it with two full lines and one dotted line. Um, I often say that in chemistry, when we draw a dotted line, that means we're not quite sure. <laughs> um, but in this case, we actually are sure. So this is related to kind of the internal electron counting of the molecule. Um, and it does indicate that the bond between the two ruthenium atoms is a multiple bond character. Um, and the bond order is two and a half. What was the other part of the question? It was a comment, um, very intriguing compound, which makes me wonder about the intermediate and associated kinetics. Yep, we wonder about that too. So I'm wondering, um, my training a catalyst doesn't change in the reaction. You showed that it, during the reaction, you can see a change and then it gets restored. Okay. Is that a cyclical reaction or is it a catalyst or am I making a distinction that's no, that's that's a, a really good question, and um, I think it, it is a bit of a misconception to say that a catalyst is not changed in the course of the reaction, because it has to be if it interacts with the starting materials and allows the products to form. But what is the what we teach in GenChem is a catalyst is unchanged after the reaction is done. Uh, so whatever happens to the catalyst in the middle, the intermediate part, um, you get the catalyst unchanged at the end of the reaction, which is why you can use it again. Any questions? Yeah, here we go. You indicated that the reason ammonia is being used first in maritime 
is because of the density or the mass of a town. I would think that that would make it even more compelling for aviation. So is aviation a next target? Why wasn't it the first one? Um, there are studies to try to use ammonia as a jet fuel, yes. Um, I don't know how far along those are. Yeah, uh, two brief questions. Uh, first of all, what was the significance of that need to show November 12th of 1955? <laughs> and also, uh, didn't Hopper, didn't he gain notoriety because he became involved with the German A bomb project? Thanks. Great questions. November 12th, 1955. Very important date in history <laughs> if you are a movie buff. Uh, this is from the movie Back to the Future, <laughs> where a lightning strike features very heavily in the plot. <laughs> um, Fritz Haber had a, um, he's also a very yin-yang character. He was involved in um, this important discovery that allowed for crops and ag agriculture to flourish, but at the same time, he was involved in chemical warfare. Um, yeah, it's, it's got a mixed history. Mm -hmm. One more question. Your catalyst, was there any rational reasons why you decided to make it that way? Or is this a, a drive that two must be better than one? And actually, in regard to that previous question, it's kind of uh, sitting in the uh, pool of electron share in here. And, and is that why, why you made it that way? Or is it sort of a design? No, I very don't think it is looking at this. No, you're right. You're very insightful. Um, it is the electron sharing in between the two ruthenium atoms that allows us to get the redox potential so much lower than if you just have one ruthenium atom. So um, that is part of the design. And yes, that was deliberate. This is a quick question. I, I, I always intrigued, intrigued me that uh, to see folks who are able to do completely unrelated two things. Uh, yeah. that, did, did your musical background ever help you with that? <laughs> That's a great question. Did my <laughs> musical background ever help me in chemistry? I mean, just like something like this. I mean, absolutely, it does. You know, if you think about what is required to get really good at playing an instrument. Discipline, a lot of discipline, a lot of practice, a lot of that's not good enough, we try again. And these are also really important traits for studying science. I've known a, quite a few um, students who've gone through my lab, who've studied music or you know other things as well. Um, and you know, I can see. That it's it's not just me. It it is a helpful thing for people, and it also I think gives people a good creative outlet. You know, when things are not going well in the lab, you need to take a break, have something else to clear your mind, and music is wonderful at helping with that. I play violin, viola, and piano. Uh, Ammonia is a hazard. As anyone here, you see ammonia at the base refrigerant plant knows. How is this hazard handled when you're using ammonia as a fuel? Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, um, so the question is about how to handle using ammonia as a fuel when um, when it does have some hazardous properties. Um, so. The, the worst property of ammonia is really the smell. It has a very biting smell. 
and the detection limit of the average human nose, uh, you can detect a very, very small amount of ammonia, which actually is pretty helpful for detecting leaks. Um, and you know, you can smell it quite strongly way before you get enough of it into the atmosphere for it to for its toxicity to take effect. That's that's a really good point. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hope to see many of you next week for Scott's talk on the raw environment. Thank you very much. Ready? Yeah. ready to go? What time? You ready to go? Are you? I'll go. You go. All right, one. All right. Ah. So, yeah, I was listening online on my own so that I couldn't get here tonight. Yeah. Just FYI that it will soon the voice is coming through Garbo. Yeah, that's why Chris is up here in the past spring. Oh, I think we got to be aware of that. Figured out about the yeah, yeah. yeah it's, okay. it's frustrating okay. because our system is too complex. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, since you mentioned so much about boats, is there any future yet for atomic powered boats like the Savannah? I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we still use nuclear submarines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nuclear is not something I'm as much speed on. Right. But yeah, I'm also of the view that we should use any and every method possible mm -hmm. to get away from problems. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, appreciate it. Huh? Are they going over? The What's that? Are they going over? Hey, Did you send me the email? No. no. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.